Hello and welcome to the Golf Channel Podcast with Rex and Lab. I'm Rex Hoggard and the gentleman next to me is clearly not Ryan Labner. Ryan Labner is probably sitting on a beach as we speak with a, an expensive drink in his hand, trying to avoid his family and his wife uh, as best I can. He's on vacation this week in Puerto Rico, so Steve Sands is graciously, it's a get, we got Steve Sands. He's joined us from the parking lot at Innisbrook, correct, Stephen? Uh, I am here, yes, and, and hopefully Lav has a drink with an umbrella in it. He does. If you know Lav at all, he definitely has a drink with an umbrella. A bunch I want to cover with you. Thank you very much for joining us. I will. Uh, I want to go back to Sunday, the Players' Championship, get your thoughts on that finish. I want to talk about Monday's not-so-secret meeting between the six player directors on the PGA Tour Policy Board and representatives from Saudi Arabia's Public Investment Fund. And we'll do a little preview of the Valspar Championship. Well, you will be on the call this week. But before we get there, I needed to clear some stuff up. Apparently, they, and I brought this up on the podcast before, people have asked why we have this interaction <laughs> between us for years. Every time you and I text each other, you always respond back with the same thing. Thank you for your service. I always respond back with the same thing. Your job's not hard. And I w- just want to be clear about this because I actually said this in numerous <laughs> interviews. I understand better than anyone, I would argue, how difficult your job is. It's exceedingly oh, di- difficult. Get out of here. You just do it really, really well, and that makes me irrationally angry. So all of these years, that's been my response. Now, the other – now, I had to butter you up because the flip side of thank you for your service is – I think it was two or three years ago in Houston, correct? Is that what that was? so bad. I was in Houston. It was Veterans Day. It was so bad. So uh, bad. I'm in the the booth, and Rex is on the ground doing that real easy job. Uh And it was Veterans Day. So the producer and I were talking back and forth during a commercial. I was like, you know, it'd be cool. Let's, let's show an American flag because there are plenty of them all over the golf course. And let's see if anybody on our crew uh, happened to be a veteran. And a couple of our guys are. And we showed one of our camera guys. Uh, and he waved on camera. You know, it was very, it was very cool for those of us on camera. Yeah, and you know this, Rex. Those of us who are in front of the camera, we get all the credit. We get all the blame. The guys and the, and the men and the women who are behind the camera are the ones who actually make the whole thing go and make it work. And we wanted to give them some love. So they wave and have a good time. And we're happy veterans, you know, veterans day. Thank you for your service. At the very end, I say, thank you for your service. And they wave and it's very nice. And literally the next thing in our headset says, all right, while we have a second, let's go down to Rex. So veterans day special day in america we'd like to recognize a few of the people uh, on our crew who not only serve us so well but have served our country with great honor thank you for your service while we have a second let's go down to rex well i've been friends with rex this is two years ago in houston so let's say it's 2022 i've been friends with rex for the better part of 25 years (laughs) 25 years and I did not say, and Rex, who served admirably for our nation with the Marines, thank you for your service. Instead, I just said, send it down to Rex. And after the show was done, I've never seen Rex so angry in my life. No, I'm kidding. Okay. Rex came up to me and goes, hey, man, where's my Marine love? And I'm like, oh, it was heartbreaking because as much as we joke around about thank you for your service, and obviously we're friends and this is in private, but in my opinion, with our children, with me, with anybody, you should always say thank you for your service to someone who has served our country, whether he is a clown like you or actually <laughs> someone who has done so with incredible vigor. Sure. Uh, sure. But in all seriousness, I, I felt so bad, Rex. And you know I felt bad. And that's why you still bring it up to me two years later, which makes me laugh. I cannot believe that I forgot in that moment on Veterans Day to not say it. So for the world to know, Amen. I was wrong. I apologize. And Rex, I truly mean this from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for your service. I appreciate that. You didn't have to go that far because it oh. led to the, maybe the best unfiltered line I've ever had. The next day I saw you in the trailer. And like, I think my line was, hey, bud, let me ask you something. Like it never Great dawned line. on you as you, were, as you were throwing it down. That's fine. Don't worry about it. I, I, I don't, you know, it, it's really no big deal. But what I told you was, just so you know, when I was in the Marines, I fought for everyone's freedom except for yours. <laughs> I thought you said that in all the time you were in South Carolina, 
That's Iraq true. never invaded us. Right. Is not, that what you said? Something long. like that? Yeah. Yeah. Is. I spent my entire time in the Marines in South Carolina. Uh, and I do want to circle back around. Your job is really, really hard. You're just really, really it's good really at not. it. It's and really again, It makes me angry. But Lav and I were just talking about this last week because it, here's an idea. Right? I don't know how long those shows are at the Masters that you, you host early live from. And they're probably four hours. And you're just going on for a really, really long time. And you really never miss a beat. Well, I think it was last year. Lav and I went to the studio on the range. And you were sitting there and we even made a point of like of looking over it and pointing at you and laughing like you don't even have any notes like you, you don't have any notes. This is all going to be off the top of your head and you're just kind of you hit us with the nah, it, it'll be fine. And it was it went off perfectly. You asked the questions. We interacted. We did our song and dance. You're going to break. And you, this word comes out of your mouth. Stick around. We have plenty coming up from the Augustus. And you pause. You realize what you've done. You repeated it. Augustus. What am I saying? Augusta National Golf Club. Stick around. And you just kept moving. And I will say that's the brilliant, most brilliant thing I've ever seen in TV, because had that been me or Lav, we would have been in the fetal position to this day trying to recover from that. Get out of here. First, of all, kept going. first of all, what's amazing to me about what you guys do, and this is not just some suck up fest between me, you and Ryan, but I appreciate you saying that I'm, I'm, I'm great at it and, it and it's not that hard, blah, blah. It's really not that hard. They'll let anybody do it. Clearly, they let me do it. So, um, like any other job, Rex, you do your homework, you prepare, you trust yourself, you have confidence, no and you go. And no you don't you don't have notes. You guys, what's amazing about you and Ryan is you guys have a double skill set, whereas most of us only have one. You guys can write like gods, and you can present on television. That's a gift. That's a serious double gift. It really is. And it took work for you guys to get comfortable on camera, because I remember when you guys first came on camera, it's a very odd thing. You know, but when you guys got comfortable, which you can clearly tell you're comfortable now, you guys have a double skill set, man. I would give anything. I wanted to be a sports writer. You know the story. I wanted to be a sports writer. And Fred Shook, the professor for uh, uh, in journalism where I went to school, said, you know, you're not that good of a writer. <laughs> you ought to go to TV. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, OK. Uh, but anyway, it was uh, it's a lot of fun. I love doing that with you guys. Uh, I like opening the notebook up. Um, I'm not on the ground as much as I used to be. So I, I miss being down there with you guys. So when you guys come up to the set with us, I just think it's TV gold to, to open up your guys notebooks and let the audience go inside the ropes is, is something that you guys uh, are the best in the business at it. It's, it's always fun to have you guys there. All right. There's enough of that. I want to get your thoughts on everything that's going on in the game of golf right now, but mm. there is a TV perspective that I wanted to ask you about first, because I was watching the telecast. I believe it was on Sunday few weeks ago at PGA National and with NBC Sports and Golf Channel is trying something it seems a little bit new where you're going four wide in the mm -hmm. booth. I believe it was you and Luke Donald, Brad Faxon and Dan Hicks, if I remember correctly. Yep. I might have gotten that wrong. That's right. Yep, that's right. Give me the dynamics of that. What would you, how is that playing out in your mind being in the booth? I think it's great. Uh, I think the concept is fantastic and the concept is very simple. Uh, even for people who are not in TV, who are just, you know, golf fans watching on TV. It's a very simple concept. We give you, the broadcasters, me and Dan, uh, give you the what's, and the analysts, in that case, Brad and Luke, give you the why's. And instead of getting sick of hearing someone for, you know, four straight hours call 18 holes, you have two people doing it. So Brad and I, I was doing the play-by-play -play for the odd holes, you know, one, three, five, seven, nine. And then Dan was doing the duties on the even holes, and he had Luke Donald with him. And so Luke was basically the analyst um, on the evens. Brad was the analyst on the odds. They're in charge of telling us why something this happened or how something just happened. We are in charge of just being play-by-play -play guys, being sportscasters and, you know, doing our job and giving you the what and what's happening and that kind of stuff. And I think it works great, Rex. Um, I don't think the audience really knows the difference as far as the mechanics of it. Uh, but for us, the mechanics are a lot different. Uh, but I think conceptually it's fantastic. Uh, and I think that it, what it does is it allows broadcasters to broadcast and it allows the analyst to analyze. There's no other sport where the former player does the play-by-play. -play. That's just not the way it usually works in sports. Usually you have a sportscaster, a broadcaster, and then you have the expert. And in golf, it's kind of bled into both over the years. And I think what they're trying to do now is to see if this works out better uh, and so far so good. We, we've really enjoyed it. 
I'm going to switch to the news of the day, and I'm going to go straight to Monday's meeting. And I'm sure you've followed this as closely as anyone else. It, two parts, and I want to start with this one, and because this is a question that came up last week that Lav and I sort of kicked around, just the concept of what is the danger? Well, I'm, it's going to be a two-part question. What is the danger of the PGA Tour not doing a deal with the public investment fund? And the converse, uh, inverse of that would be what would be the danger of doing a deal with the public investment fund? I'll preface this by saying my business acumen is very low, uh, but from the experts who we've spoken to uh, and the golfers and the people in and around the tour uh, who are involved in these kinds of things, it seems to me that the danger in not doing a deal is that live won't stop and just keep spending money and taking the assets assets, meaning John Rahm, Brooks Kepka, Bryson DeChambeau, Phil Mickelson, Cam Smith, all on down the list. Uh, who's next? I don't know. Whoever they want, if they want to keep spending that money. Um, that would seem to me, Rex, as the only danger in not doing a deal. I, I have said from the beginning that I think that if the, if the PGA Tour loses a little bit in the short term in this, I think they gain in the long term if they just play it out. That's easier said than done. I'm not the one who's on the receiving end of my best assets receiving hundreds of millions of dollars and being taken away. So to me, the recruitment part and just keep taking players seems to be the one thing that would be or the biggest thing to me that would be the, mo the biggest deterrent to not making a deal. As far as making a deal, you know, um, does every sponsor want to uh, overtly, not covertly, because most companies do business uh, with Saudi Arabia, do they want to overtly be involved? Uh, in that venture. Um, what does that venture look like? What do those fields look like? What are the field sizes? Is there team golf involved? Is there going to be music blaring? Are they going to play shotgun starts? Are they going to play 54 holes? Are they going to be, you know, a team aspect with names that most Americans uh, who are watching golf on a regular basis don't understand? Um, I don't know. I, to me, it doesn't seem like the PGA Tour needs a deal right now. Um, but they also need to make sure they keep their best players. So I, I don't know. That's a great question. But I, I do people want to be in business in that regard, not with the Saudis per se, but in that type of venture. I don't know if all the companies who sponsor PGA Tour golf tournaments right now uh, want to do those kinds of things. Well, and I know this is more than you signed on for. So uh, not brace at all. yourself. Uh, no, not no, at all. because we this happened last week and I was kind of thrown by the idea. And I think it was on live from talking about just the comings and goings of the day. And I was asked about specifically, what does it mean Monday's meeting? What does it mean? And, and I think the line that I said was, it's a positive step in the negotiations because in my mind, I have boiled this down to the simplest business terms. And I, I got beat up on X, which is nothing new. I'm used to it happening. But for the reasons that you just pointed out, there is still a segment of the population. I don't know how large or how small that still doesn't believe the PGA Tour should be in business with, with the Saudis for moral reasons. And this is something that, and I don't know why I glossed over it because it dominated the conversation for two straight years. I right. felt like we, we'd gotten to the point in a biz, from a business perspective only where there was no more conversations about it. Should we do this or should we do this on moral grounds? I, I thought we had moved on from that when the tour, when Jay Monahan decided to pivot, when he decided that, okay, on June 6th, we're going to sign this framework agreement and try right. to come up with some sort of deal. In my mind, that story, that part of the story had moved on. It's probably not fair and it's clearly not accurate because I think there is still a, a segment of the population that either one, isn't comfortable with it, or two, is just flatly against it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I also think, how do you get the players back, Rex? Like, I, I think that there's an inherent risk in taking the money and not knowing how the end result is going to play out. And I also think there's an inherent risk in not taking the money and staying and see how it all plays out. I, I also think that the guys who went, hey, they're prerogative. Go ahead. Do whatever you want. Take your money. Um, you know, go play over there. Play out the string. Whatever the situation is for you, only you know what's best for you and your family. I have no problem with those guys taking the money and going to live. I have no problem with live. I have no problem with any of it. I do think the guys who stayed – they have a right to be angry 
if the guys who left and took the money are just welcomed back. I, I just don't see how there's an avenue for that. I don't see how they could go to the guys who stayed, who turned down the money. And I'm not talking about just Tiger and Rory who turned down $500, $800 million, whatever the heck it is. I'm talking about anybody. And I would be really upset if I was a PGA Tour player, Rex, if this framework deal ends up coming together and the guys end up right back on tour. I, I just can't see how that happens. I, you, I, I just cannot imagine that happening. No, and it's twofold here. And I do, I, I do want to go back to Monday's meeting. And I do see this as a positive step in the negotiations. You can make your own decision. But negotiating for what? That's what I'm asking. Uh, what negotiating they, they, toward some sort of reunification of the game, whatever that looks like. And I do want to get into that. I, but what, what I wanted to touch on was just the concept of they're not bringing the player directors, the six player directors, that includes right. Tiger Woods. They're not bringing them to the Bahamas with the governor of the public investment front of Saudi Arabia, uh, Yasir al Ramayan. I've ran scared from that name for two years. I finally am comfortable enough to actually give it a shot because I feel like that. All right. If I can't is do he, it now, is I'm it never Yasser going to get it. or is it Yasir? Uh, it's Yasser from what I was told. I'm not 100% sure there. Again, I leak a lot of confidence when I try to say that name. I love it. It's, I, it's, I, I, I'm, I'm so fascinated by who's decided, Rex, to be on the board and get involved. Man, when you get Tiger Woods involved in something, Rex, that's a big darn deal, man. And I, I, I'm so fascinated to see how this is all going to play out. I just don't see how the staunch tour guys allow a deal to take place that involves the guys who left and got the cash to come back. And the only punishment is not having equity. I just cannot imagine a paved road back for the guys who, who want to come back from live to play PGA tour events. I could see them having to take a circuitous route but I cannot see it being just a paved road right back to the PGA tour. Do you? No, no. And I think that's going to be, it. I, I guess Monday's meeting in my mind is a positive step because you're not bringing the player directors in to have them go over spreadsheets. Tiger positive Woods step how? Why? why uh, well, step? well, well, hear, hear me out. I like, they're not going to be in on the negotiations as far as these are, these are, this is a multi-billion dollar deal. They're not qualified to be in the room for that. What they're in there for is, one, to learn exactly what the motivations are of the governor of the, of the public investment fund. Why does he want to be involved in golf? And to tackle the two issues that you just touched on. Because I think that's going to be the tipping point in all of this. One, what does the path back look like? Because you, you get a lot of answers from both sides. I've asked players on both sides, and you're clearly going to get a lot of opinions on that front. And two, how does team golf fit into this? I mean, I, I go to what – Rory told me on Sunday at the Players Championship where he imagines a scenario. And I have found where Rory talks on this issue, he seems to have some sort of insight that the rest of us don't have. He sees it, quote unquote, on the periphery. Team cough would be played in January, in October, in November, in December, and everything else in between would be the traditional individual stroke play events that we've all come to love and know. And I'm thinking that's probably where we're headed, but I don't know if that works for both sides. So well, those two issues. Say that. I was literally yeah. just going to say, does that work for the other side? Probably not. Probably not. And I guess this goes to what the conversation was like on Monday in the Bahamas, where if the governor is comfortable with, if Al Ramayan is comfortable with the idea of, okay, my product, Live Golf, can be on the shoulders as long as I'm involved with everything else that goes on in between. And we've been told by people who know, who, who I feel like know, that Al Ramayan just wants a seat at the table. He wants to have a say in the direction of the future game. If that's the case, then maybe it does work. But it doesn't seem with the investment that he continues to make in Lyft Golf. And signing John Rahm was a huge step. Why do that if all you wanted was a seat at the table? Yeah, no, I agree with that. And I also think that, yeah, I know that they want a seat at the table. I get all that. But when you're spending the amount of money they're spending, I mean – have they ever heard of the NFL? If they're just going to do team golf in November, or December, they might want to check the calendar in the American audience because the American audience doesn't really have an appetite for any type of team sport when the weather turns cold other than football. And I, 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 I it's so interesting to me how this is all going to shake out. It will shake out. 
And I know that the meetings, you know, the last couple of days were productive and I, and I get all that, but I just, I, I think the sticking point is what's the schedule going to look like? I think there's two big sticking points among many, but what's the schedule going to look like for both sides? Uh, because both sides have to come to an agreement on that if they're actually going to come to an agreement. And the other is this team concept and bringing guys back onto the PGA Tour, they're going to have to pay a price. And I don't know whether that's monetarily or whether that's time-wise or they have to go to Q school or whatever that is. But I, I, I think most of the guys on the PGA Tour are reticent in a big-time way to that's allow fair. these guys to just come back. All right, I'm going to take a look back to last weekend. We had a Sunday night podcast. We broke down everything, but obviously you were not on that. So I do want to get your thoughts on what happened Sunday and specifically really the last two weeks with Scotty Scheffler. And I was just asked in an interview I did with a a radio show in Utah about the idea. Can you say that this is Tiger-esque? And I hate using that. I think both you we're both going to agree. You and I, the skin crawls when you do that, because it's such an unfair comparison. But would you say it's Tiger-esque? I would not say it's Tiger-esque. What I would say is, it's McElroy from 2011 to 2014, or it's Jordan Spieth from 2015 to 2017. Um, and that's not discounting what he's done. What he's done is absolutely remarkable. And he is a clear number one, a clear favorite. And he proved it again on Sunday at the players, not only because he's the first guy to defend the title at the players, but because of the way he won, the way he was feeling, uh, he is not playing his best. And he still went out and won against the best field of the year uh, in the biggest event so far in 2024. And uh, he's a great player. Uh, he's a Hall of Fame player. If he never hits another golf ball again, uh, I get all that. But I, I'm, I lean more towards pausing on saying Tiger-esque until it's a more sustained greatness over time. And not every golfer gets on a heater and every golfer struggles. And he's on a heater, and he's great, and he's the best player in the world. But to compare him to Tiger just yet, to me, I don't like rubbing the anointing oil all over somebody uh, too quickly. And I think that to say this is Tiger-esque would be just a step too far for me right now. I'm always of the same mindset. Again, it always kind of makes my skin crawl because, it's it, it's number one, it's kind of a cheap sports radio thing to do. Well, yeah, it's a Tiger-esque yeah. run. And, but I will say, and you and I have seen it enough in our careers, for him to win as dominant as he was the week before mm. Bay Hill, to win by five, the way he putted on Sunday at Arnie's place, all of those things were impressive enough. And then to do what Tiger Woods never did in his career, what Jack Nicklaus never did in his career, to win the Players' Championship back-to-back, and to do it with clearly not his best stuff. If you, I talked to Ted Scott on Sunday. It's amazing. Ted Scott was shocked he even finished up the Friday round. He said not only did it hurt to swing the club, it hurt for him to even hit chip shots. To so get an idea of how difficult this was. And it goes to the idea that, that I think all of us have said all along. If Scotty just puts average, he doesn't have mm-hmm. to put great like he did Sunday at Bay Hill. If he just puts average, he's going to win more times than not. This was one of those times when he put it average, and he won this time more times than not. Of the it, two – oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say what's interesting about that is, is that – Remember when Tiger first came out and said, oh, you know, I didn't have my A game. And everybody's like, oh, what the hell does that mean? You know, that kind of stuff. Remember all that stuff years ago? And Scotty did not have his A game, man. And he still won. And I I wasn't joking around on the air, but I said, I go, listen, this guy strikes the golf ball so cleanly, so crisply, so well, so amazingly great that the putter doesn't need to be hot. It just needs to be stuck in the microwave for a couple of seconds just to warm up. Because if he putts at all, he's going to be on the leaderboard. Now, you can make a case that I, I was telling this to our producer, Tommy Roy, today. I can't believe 20 under held up. I can't believe 20 under was not before the week. 20 under is amazing. I'm talking about on Sunday when you saw the landscape and what was going on. When Scotty posted 20, I thought that was going to be at least a two man playoff, maybe a three man playoff. Xander missing that putt at 17 was unfortunate. Brian's ball checking up out of the pine straw with a second shot at 18 was unfortunate. Wyndham down Clark, wind. downwind. Wyndham Clark, a little bit too much pace. That ball goes in, you know, eight, nine out of 10 times with it's a 270 degree lip out. That was crazy. Um, I thought 20 under was going to be a playoff. 
and it ended up being enough. And all credit to Scotty, man. He is so good. He is so great. I'm just not ready to call it Tiger Woods yet. Not yet. 82 and 15 is a long, long, long ways away. No, I agree with that. Of the, I'm glad you brought up the, the guys who finished runner-up. Of the three that finished runner-up, who do you think left TPC Sawgrass, let's call it the most angry? Uh, great question. Uh, I would say... I would say Xander probably had the should have won that. Uh, Wyndham should have been in a playoff because he got robbed on that last one, but it was a lot of pace on that putt. Uh, he did not have a great Saturday. Uh, didn't quite have everything going for him on the weekend, uh, but Xander was leading. Uh, Xander was playing well, uh, and he just he let a few opportunities slip by. And what happens in this sport? And it happens all the time. The greats of the greats, they don't get them handed to them. They, they, they earn them all. But sometimes the seas part for the great ones. And they don't, they don't part for the good ones and the really good ones. But for the great ones, the seas part. I mean, Tiger earned that Masters in 2019. He's absolutely the Masters champion. Molinari in the water. You know, Finau, not much. Kepka at the end. Ian, uh, Ian Poulter, maybe? Um, there was one other person. Xander Shoffley uh, didn't hit a great shot uh, at, at 16. Uh, and then you have this past weekend. I mean, Wyndham Clark played very, very well. Probably should have been in a playoff. Doesn't mean he's going to win it. Um, and Scotty ends up winning because he gets a lip out from Wyndham. He gets a short miss by Xander at 17. And Harmon isn't able to take advantage of it coming down the stretch. And Scotty's the number one player in the world. And he's number one because he's the best. And he's number one because he's also sometimes he gets a little fortunate. And that's all credit to him. I, I'm a big believer, Rex, and, you know, luck is the residue of hard work. And I don't think he was lucky at all. He was the best one. But I would say that Xander, to me, would probably in a quiet moment be the angriest. And then Wyndham. And then Brian. And Brian is the one who, you know, plays the angriest. Uh, which I love. I love watching Brian Harmon play golf, and I'm starting to love. I, I, I've switched on Wyndham. Wyndham's not hot. He's great. He's been on leaderboards for a year now. He's a reigning U.S. Open champion. He's got two other wins, which are signature wins. He's on leaderboards every single week. It seems like he was runner-up to the best player in the world the last two weeks. If it wasn't for Scotty Scheffler, Wyndham Clark would have won the last two weeks. So he has switched from being hot to being great. Uh, Brian Harmon's just a, a, a baller. And Scotty Scheffler is an all-time talent. I, I was tinkering with some leads talking about writing on Sunday. And uh, I was going to write Wyndham Clark because it seemed like early in the round it was going to be. Put your seatbelt on in case someone runs into you. I, I, was I, hit the gas, I think I hit the gas thing. Sorry. Yeah. I'm trying to uh, balance. I'm trying to balance this iPad. I, yeah, I'm I could tell. I'm talking to you like this. It's, it's, Sorry, it's been quite difficult. I'm sure your arms have gotten quite shaky. I now. apologize. Uh, you know, these these weak arms, these non-marine arms, are not able to sure. hold this thing up. Uh, I was tinkering with some leads on Sunday when it looked like Wyndham Clark could win, and I I came right. to the idea that I, it, it, the superstar of status isn't there yet, and I'm really I'm kind of curious why. He's got Hollywood good looks. He's got an inspiring origin story if we can go back and and look at everything he's been through he's already won a major two signature events to your point finished runner up at another signature event and runner up at the players championship I, I have to believe that at some point he's going to be that's what that's what Jason Gore talked about when he told Jay Monahan the PGA Tour can make a star in three weeks I feel like that's an example of what Wyndham Clark is no oh I, t I totally agree I you know what's interesting about the live PGA Tour argument. One thing that I think it's lost in that argument. Do we miss Brooks Kepka and Phil Mickelson and Cam Smith and Bryson DeChambeau and John Rahm? Of course we miss them. Of course everybody misses them. But the platform that is the PGA Tour, this is not a PGA Tour, you know, you know, love fest. But the platform, the PGA Tour, it's different than the NFL and the NBA. And here's why. The difference to me is we all, as sports fans, when we see someone get drafted in the NBA and the NFL, we kind of know them from college basketball and college football. You can be the greatest amateur golfer in the world. Forget Tiger and forget Phil a little bit. But, you know, they're, they're two ridiculously crazy players. Take Ryan Moore, for instance. You can't be a better amateur than Ryan Moore. Ryan Moore, go look at Ryan Moore. You're bored out there. Go Google Ryan Moore's amateur career and tell me you can be a better amateur than Ryan Moore. 
absolutely no one ever heard of Ryan Moore until he got to the PGA Tour and won. And that's the difference between golf and the other sports. So a guy like Wyndham Clark, Wyndham Clark, no one ever heard of him. He's a tremendous player in Oregon, tremendous young talent, great looking, American, speaks well, is accessible, is, you know, has energy. Everybody likes him. And it took a big, big, big win before someone really recognized who this guy was. No offense to his win at the Wells, Fargo, but it took the U.S. Open to take down Rory and Ricky at LACC for someone to think he's a star. Then he backs it up with a couple more big wins, and you're like, wow, this kid's got a lot of game. Well, the PGA Tour platform allows that. And I, I think that Wyndham, man, Wyndham's, wait, he's a great player, Rex. He's a great guy. He's a great player. And he can be around a long time. Okay, real quick, the Valspar Championship this week. I'm going to put you on the spot. You've been at all four of them forever. Where does Valspar rank in just the floor to swing and why? Oh, man, it's, it's, I always get this question. Um, it's, the, it's the only course that the PGA Tour plays in Florida where it looks like you're in the north. There, there's some hills, there are undulations, tree-lined, thick, rough, fast greens, small greens. Uh, it's an awesome golf course. Uh, I don't think there's a golf course – on the planet with a better finish than what we saw last week. Par 5, 16th, 17th, the most famous hole in the world. You can argue it's the best, but it's the most famous. And 18 is a, is a very, very challenging par 4. Um, you know, you don't have that here. So I would say Sawgrass to me, because of the stature of the event and because the golf course is just a rock star, um, I think that that's the best one. But the Valspar and this golf course are so good. Bay Hill's great. It's Arnie, always a good field. All the memories from Tiger, all the great players who have won there, the whole deal, the Arnie celebration, can't beat it. The Cognizant sometimes gets lost in the shuffle depending on its date and depending on its field. Um, but this golf course is widely regarded by all the best players, Rex, as one of their favorites on the PGA Tour and one of the toughest tests on the PGA Tour. And usually when the test is tougher – the cream rises to the top. And I, I think we're going to have a big week this week. Steven Sands, good job. It's not hard. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> that's it? That's it, That's all buddy. we got? That's, that's, that's all the, you got. Who's going to win the NCAA tournament? Uh, well, since the Maryland fighting Steve Sands is, don't seem to have much of a chance. I don't know. You probably would have picked. It. Had we done you this yesterday, be, you would have picked Virginia, right? You got to be in it to have a chance, Rex. <laughs> uh, no, I would not have taken UVA. UVA can't score. They stink. They do stink. UVA basketball, I saw this on a T-shirt, is Iowa football, which I thought was a brilliant T-shirt. Oh, that's a great comparison. That's really good, isn't it? Yeah. Hey, are you, right, and, Ryan bring, are you and Ryan going to bring some heat at Live From the Masters? Absolutely. Are you going to bring notes? Can I just tell the audience one thing? Are we, are we in a hurry? Absolutely. We got to go? No, no. So I got, got. One, one of my favorite things to do ever is in our ear, if you can picture this out there in, in podcast land, in our ear, we hear, okay, minute to air. 30 seconds, coming back in 15, you know, whatever, 10. Whatever, that kind of At about the 15 or 10 mark, Ryan and Rex are kind of getting their stuff straight and their notepads and they're straightening out their tie. And Ryan always has, oh, you are the one who always has goofy socks on and the whole thing. And, of course, we got nothing in front of us. And at about the 10-second mark, I love to look over at Rex and go, is that what, you is that what you're going to wear? Okay. <laughs> and Good you're time. like – and you always the first time go, huh? Because you don't catch it the first time, huh? And I go, I mean, is that what we're going to go with? As the guy, as the director's going, two, one. <laughs> it just makes me laugh every time. And Rex and Ryan, they get all nervous. And, oh, my God, does it not look right? No, I'm just messing with you, man. You always look sharp. Uh, it's, a, it's a good joke. It's an old joke. I did want to ask, and again, <laughs> we got to get Goldie out of here. I did want to ask, though, because the hardest thing when I joke about your job's not hard, the <laughs> hardest thing is you're doing these things with someone talking in your ear. Whew, man. And, and when I, most producers I work with, Arthur Vol Volpe, for example, a, a really good producer that we have, he has come to understand that, and he won't talk to me if I'm talking. He'll wait right. for me to do But you can't do that in the position you're in. Is that the most challenging part of the job for you, or is it something else? Yeah, the, the, probably the biggest difference between my job and your job is that as the host, we've got to know what the traffic is. We've got to know where we're going, what we're doing, what's yeah. going on. We don't need to be told what to say, but if they're going to go to the range because Tiger Woods just walked onto the range, we've got to know that in our ear because if you're talking, they can do that. Uh, the only time it ever gets really tricky 
is at the very, very, very beginning of your career when you answer the producer on the air. <laughs> says, Did you do that? Okay. Have you of done course, that? Everybody, everybody does. Everybody goes, yeah, okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, you know, that kind of stuff. But that's why you go to Scottsbluff, Nebraska, and where, you know, very few people are watching. Um, but the most challenging thing is when you're talking and something's going on in the truck uh, that they know about that you don't, uh, and they have to tell you while you're talking. The other thing that's interesting is sometimes you'll be speaking. I used to joke about this with Tiger. When I was doing interviews on NBC, I'm in the booth now, but when I was doing it, uh, when I was on the ground doing the interviews, I used to joke with Tiger all the time because Tiger used to say, he goes, What's going on in the, what's going on in the headset? You know, I'm like, oh, there's a lot going on. You want to hear it? He goes, no, no, I'm good. I'm just, I'm just curious. I said, you know, what's amazing is sometimes it's so loud in there in your ear headset. If you would have said, I said, it's Tiger. If you would have said, hey, man, I've just decided I, I've had enough. I'm going to retire. I might, I might be apt to say, congratulations on a great day, Tiger. See you tomorrow. And like not even hear him. <laughs> so sometimes when you're saying something, it's so funny because sometimes when you're saying something, which is quality journalism and Ryan and you are going back and forth, if they're telling me something in me in my ear, I can't really hear exactly every word you're saying. So sometimes it gets a little, um, a little squirrely as, as, as far as that goes. But for the most part, like anything else, Rex, what you do, what everybody who's watching this or listening to this does once you get reps and you get used to it, it's really not that big of a deal. I, I've been, I, I laugh and I tell people all the time, really, truly, the only learned skill in our business is that you can multitask. Other than that, uh, I think a monkey could do it. All right. Uh, Goldie's going to kill me for this, but I, I do want to do the follow up. Oh, Goldie's fine. Keep going. Because we were, we were talking about this a few weeks ago when uh, it was probably during the Cognizant when you guys were four wide in the booth. And I said, that has to be really difficult because one of the things that uh, I do admire about uh, anyone who does the live telecast is you have to work in such small windows where if, if Lavner and I are on live from with you, Lavner's going to gas bag for three minutes out of a four minute yeah. segment. That's just what he does. He can't do that. You can't do that during the live telecast. Right. Right. And the, for me, I only do live telecast except once a year. I do the studio show and I'm honored to do it. And I love doing it. Matt Haggerty and live from those guys, the men and women who work on those shows are absolutely remarkable. Uh, and that brand is just huge for us uh, at golf channel. And I'm honored to be the host in the morning at the masters. It's, it's one of my favorite weeks of the year, but it's the only time that I'm in a studio in that particular week. It's a long form show. We're on the air for four hours. I mean, forever and ever with no live golf, we're just going. And on live golf, on live, whatever the sport is, if we're doing live sports, those windows, as you say, are small. So a lot of times for the play-by-play guy, for us, you know, we'll just say Thomas for birdie at three and then let it open it up for the person on the ground and then the analyst to talk. And then he comes back to us and he makes the button. You say, oh, he's only one back, you know, that kind of stuff. And for the live from stuff, the studio stuff, when I'm with you and Rex, uh, you and Ryan, when you guys are going, I'm always thinking the difference between live golf and live from is exactly what you just said. It's a small window in live golf. Unless a guy backs off a shot and we don't go somewhere else, that's when you can throw in a story or a, no, or a nugget or a conversation you had with a player. But on live from, when it's me, you, and Ryan up there or whoever's up there with us, and we go to the range and we can talk about something. You have all the time in the world for the most part. And it's, it's such, such a, a different week, uh, a rewarding week, uh, but a lot different, uh, as you say, than doing live golf. We don't, we don't have that kind of time in live golf because people don't want – my mother – my mother's no longer alive. But my, my mother was alive. She used to say to me all the time. She passed away five years ago. That's what I was telling you. So my mother used to say to me all the time. She was a sports fanatic. She used to say all the time. Why aren't you guys on more like a typical mom? Why aren't you on more? I, I see Lester Holt on all the time. I see Brian Williams on all the time. Why aren't you on more? You know, I'm like, mom, in sports, it's about the competition. It's about the golf. It's not about us. Now, news is not about the anchor either. You just see the anchor all the time. For us, there's no reason to ever see us. Uh, and there's no really no reason to hear from us either when it comes to live golf. Live from that's a lot different. We're trying to get the best conversation out of you guys who are the experts. And that's what the host job is. And that's what makes that job that particular week 
so much fun is hearing from you guys bringing it. How about when Jack Nicholas comes in and Raymond Floyd comes in and Ben Crenshaw comes in and you guys come in. It's, it's amazing. It's a, it's a lot of fun. It's an honor to be there. It's a lot of fun. Now you just gasped back for 39 minutes on this podcast. If you had to take the entire telecast from, I don't know, pick a day, Thursday at the Cognizant, how, how many words, how many minutes do you think you actually talked? Is it, it in a three hour telecast? Is it going to be 15 minutes? I'm glad we don't get paid by the word. Let's put it that way. Uh, I'm glad I don't but, get paid by the but, word. But, but Rex, I will say this. I, I will say this. I was told years ago, so when I got the job at the Golf Channel, I was doing football and basketball and baseball and hockey and horse racing and tennis, all these other sports. I had never done live golf. And love golf, play golf, watch golf. I'd never done live golf on TV. And I was told a great phrase, and 25 years later, it still resonates with me every time I go on the air. You should broadcast golf the way you play it. You would never speak over a golf shot. So if someone's standing over a shot, you need to hear, and we can speak up until that point. You can speak afterwards, but you cannot speak while a player's hitting. If you and I went to go play, we're in golf carts, we're in shorts, having a couple of beers, you know, betting a couple of dollars. We're not talking to each other's backswings, talking while we're, you know, doing it. We're telling stories, we're laughing, but for the most part, you want to broadcast golf the way you play golf. And that's something that hopefully uh, the audience understands uh, that we're trying to do. For the most part, we really are trying to get out of the way. Thank you, buddy. Steven Sands all week long at the Valspar Championship. Check out golfchannel.com or nbcsports.com slash golf for all your news and notes this week. We'll be back on Sunday night when Ryan Lavender may or may not be back from Puerto Rico. If not, Steve, I'll be giving you a call. Thanks, buddy. I'll be here, bud. Thanks for having me on.